Hello everyone, I'd like to bring to the floor Sarah Stewart. Uh, Sarah is a midwife and currently works as a professional officer at the Australian College of Midwives. She's been working as a midwife, mid midwifery lecturer and educational developer for 13 years in New Zealand. Uh, I know myself that I've been following Sarah for a number of years and I've learnt so much. So without further ado, uh, please, Sarah, please come to the microphone. We're proud to have you. Well, thank you very much, um, Janice, for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. Um, before we go any further, can I just check with you all that you can hear me? Um, is there anyone having problems at all? Just waiting to see there if anyone... We can hear you, problems. actually, yes, Excellent. nice and clear. Great. All right, that's and good. Just, just wondering, Janita, if you were going to go through the slides. I'll tell you what, I've got my fingers on the port here. Okay, you're right there. <laughs> so yes, we have started recording. And Janita, do you want to talk about the sponsors? As you know, Aussie Live is brought to you this weekend. And thanks to our sponsors, Blackboard Collaborate, and of course the Australian E-Series team who are working very hard behind the scenes. Uh, Cyber Academy, Coach Carol Lett and the Learning Revolution. We want to say, and also the last one is the end of course shambles of Guru of course. Thank you very much to our sponsors. Thank you. And um, uh, well, I'll, I'll say a few words about myself. Um, and while you're doing while I'm doing that, maybe you'd like to um, click on your little smiley faces there and drag them across to um, where you are in the world. Um, I'm actually now living in Canberra, have been in Canberra now for um, 18 months. So I've made the transition from very cold, wet, I need through to Canberra, where it's been very hot this last um, couple of months. So it's been a bit of a transition for me in all sorts of ways. And the other transition I've made is from um, moving from education into industry. And um, and um, that's been an interesting move as well. But anyway, I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about my experiences and the lessons I've learned as a facilitator of the Virtual International Day for Midwife. Um, now, um, Jacinta's going to keep a, a track on the time for me because I am a notorious, notoriously bad at keeping time. But what I'd like to do today is um, run through some slides um, tell you my story, pass on some information that I hope you'll find of use, and then um, open up the floor to questions and discussions. And I'm also actually very happy to take questions as we go along. And um, so Jacinta, again, if you can keep an eye on the questions for me, I'm extremely happy to stop and chat about things as we go along. So we keep this as informal mm -hmm. and interactive as we can. Is that okay? Yes, lovely, thank you. Okay, so um, welcome um, everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about a virtual conference that I've been involved with. Um, we're now just about to head into our, gosh I've lost track, but it's our sixth or seventh year. Um, very similar sort of format to um, the format we've got today but in a very different context. And um, we've been going there for quite some years and um, learned some very interesting lessons along the way. So um, I hope that you'll find some of those lessons equally as interesting. And yes, Carol, I can't believe it. Um, actually, it might be six years this year. And um, although we actually started the year before with some experimentation. And yes, that's Blackie, my cat. And she always used to, unfortunately, she died about a year ago, but she always used to keep me company when um, I was doing anything virtual. And very annoyingly, used to sit on my laptop many times. So as I said, I want to talk to you about the Virtual International Days of Midwife and explain to you how we use social media to support um, that initiative and how we use it to um, provide professional development and to pass on some of those lessons. Well, I just want to give you a little bit of context and back, um, 
context and background first. Um, and while I'm doing that, can I can you write just very quickly in the chat box and here here whether you are educators, whether you are teachers, um, you know, what role do you have, whether you're nurses, midwives, policemen, whatever, just give me a bit of a sense of how to um, um, frame this up, because I don't want to be rabbiting on about nursing if you're all teachers, and I obviously need to reframe what I want to say in more of a education context. But midwives um, and nurses, we're health professionals, and we've got very similar um, expectations on us as, as teachers and lecturers and higher education, people who work in higher education. Um, we have, we're professionals, we have our uh, clinical practice just as teachers have their teaching practice, um, and um, we are expected to perform uh, certain activities during the year in order to keep up our yearly registration. And maybe in the chat box you could just a little write a little bit. Do you um, just let me know? Do you have any expectations that you have to maintain as educators? See, the majority of you are educators. Do you have to do CPD during the year? Is it something that um, is nice to do, or is it something you actually have to do from a legal point of view? As midwives, we do have to do that from a legal point of view. Um, we've got to, in Australia, we have to do 20 hours professional development a year. And that could be anything from going to attending a conference through to um, reading a, a research journal. And um, we have to then uh, reflect on it and write it up, what we've learnt. And the um, majority of us, um, we do, well, I suspect the majority of us pop along to the odd conference and that's about it. Whereas um, um, there's no real checking up on us. Um, but um, the regulator, regulator that uh, checks all our registrations is going to start auditing us. Too. So I think that will put um, a lot of people really get them thinking about how they do their professional development. And um, there are a number of barriers for people um, doing their professional development. And I suspect it's the same in teaching and education as it is for us as health professionals. And that is geography. Um, no, you're not going to see how they is delivered. Um, you can, um, I'm sure, go to YouTube. There's lots of certain videos there. <laughs> um, geography, especially in a big country like um, Australia, uh, very difficult for people to get to um, live face-to-face education events, uh, especially those who live in more rural, remote areas. And, and that's, of course, one of the reasons why these online events like this are so popular people can attend wherever they are, wherever they live. Uh, money is an issue. I don't know about you, but the last time I booked to go to a conference, the face conference, it cost me nearly two and a half thousand dollars. By the time I paid registration fees, um, I um, paid for my flights, accommodation, so on and so forth, and of course, um, time away from work. So it's very expensive to go to face-to-face -face events. And even if you sign up for a diploma or a degree or, or, or whatever, again, it's very expensive. Um, the other thing we, the other issues, uh, we have a time. And um, again, I, I, I think it's the same for professionals all over. It's all, it's all very well saying um, that there are CPD events and activities for you to go to, but if you're very short staff in your school, in your um, educational institution, um, in your midwifery practice and you can't leave, your practice to get away to these events then you're stuck. So those are a number of um, number of um, challenges for us and um, as midwives and I say I suspect the same in the world over uh, in other health professions. And that's just for us in uh, that's uh, I'm speaking as a midwife and a, an educator in Australia, in um, developed countries. People there, you can see a picture of my dear friends in um, Karachi, Pakistan. They're, cha they're faced with even greater challenges because they don't have the um, resources that I do as a um, midwife in a developed country. And so six, seven years ago, um, it really hit me that I was um, 
really fed up with being left behind. I don't know if you can see that picture very well, but it's a it's the staff board where I used to work in the school of midwifery. And you'll see that everybody's out except for me. I'm the only one left in the office. Everybody else has gone up to um, up to Glasgow for a very big international midwifery conference, and I was the only one who left. I was left behind because I couldn't afford to go. I didn't have any holiday, and I was really upset about this. I have to say, and so I thought we've got to do something about this, um, and um, that's what got me into thinking about um, starting a virtual events. I suppose some of you might say, well, I don't know why she's talking about this. This is all very old hat these days. I mean, look at us. We're, we're doing exactly what I'm talking about. We're doing this now, uh, attending a virtual conference. But six, seven years ago, um, it was still the whole virtual conferencing thing was a, very much a, um, a new idea. And there weren't many people doing it. Uh, there was a few people um, in education. And I'm not quite sure when Steve um, started his um, monthly sessions, but um, Joe Hart course has been running virtual conferencing, virtual PD, CPD for a number of years now. Um, but certainly in health, in midwifery and nursing, even to this day, we continue to be one of the only events of its kind. I did this, um, seven years ago, I did do a year where I did monthly CPD sessions online, but I found that it was such a big commitment that actually felt that um, it would be much better to pour our energies into um, one event once a year uh, rather than um, continually um, having to organize um, seminars online. So we got together a number of us. A um, few of us, of course, we were midwives. Um, I have to say mostly in the education sector. But also there were a number of people who became involved. Carol was one of them. Um, Carol helped us out a number of years and so did Joe Hart. Um, so there were people who joined us um, who were from education and passionate about um, supporting a group of people to learn. Um, and we came together, there was about six, eight of us. Well, actually, it was me to start off with, and then gradually over the years we developed a committee of about six, eight of us. And our aims have been very much to provide access to midwives, the latest research and practice innovations, and, and all those things that you can see on the slides, you can read it yourself, um, breaking down those um, barriers to professional development that I've already talked about. But also what was really important to us is not just to actually to provide a, a, a conference um, once a year, but it's also to model the process of development um, as we got there. And that's why we're getting to the use of social media in a minute. We wanted to actually show complete transparency um, and show to people how an event like this could be organized. And uh, in itself, then actually model the use of the tools as we went along. So we um, chose to use social media tools, which I'll talk about in a minute, because they are openly available, um, and people could see the processes we use to actually get to the end point, the outcome, which was the conference. So um, that was very important to us. Um, and we use so we use open tools, and we also use open and transparent processes and methodologies, which we um, we took that philosophy because we a we wanted to um, model to people how to use the tools, particularly the tools that are free, because we've never had any sponsorship, and we've always stayed clear of sponsorship. Uh, and last year we got I think forty pounds from a midwifery organization which allowed us to buy uh, um, an email system and actually a domain, domain name. But we've always steered clear of sponsorship because in midwifery, there's not many people you can actually provide sponsorship without getting into trouble. Um, so for example, we could get sponsorship very easily from a formula company, for example, but that causes all sorts of philosophical problems, um, which I don't want to go into now, but uh, I can always talk to you about that later if you're interested. So we've um, 
So we use uh, social media because it's mostly free and because it's transparent and um, we stuck to principles around open education resource. So any outcomes that we that um, we developed as a result of the event, say for example the recording, we openly published them as recording so people that can could reuse them. Again, I know it's 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 um, what's happening here today. So that's really great to see that our vision that we started out with six or seven years ago, people are replicating today. The other thing was that um, we wanted to show people, particularly midwives in areas, um, under-resourced areas, particularly in developing countries, we wanted to model to them how you could provide something um, that, um, you know, on a shoestring. Now having said that, of course, the big expense um, of in an, any event like this is the actual virtual room. And we've always been very lucky. I said we don't take sponsorship, but actually we are sponsored in a way because um, over the years we've been able to um, have the virtual room provided by an educational institution. So that is a big cost which we have been able to um, cover um, through usually actually an employer of one of the committee members. Now I just want to check in with you. Uh, I do tend to talk very quickly. Um, so are you able you're all following me okay. Put your hands up if you're if you're okay and follow what I'm saying. Good. Don't be afraid to um, um, but, um, tell me to slow down. So I get a bit carried away and excited. So I don't want to talk too much about the day itself, um, because I want to talk more about the social media stuff. But basically we have a similar format to what you've got now. Um, there's a session every hour for 24 hours. And um, the reason why we chose 24 hours is because it's an international conference. So um, we, we know there are lots of barriers to this conference, not least people who don't have internet access obviously cannot attend. But one of the barriers that we did want to break down was time zone. So we have a 24 hour session and every hour is a session, um, different presentation and um, we have a team of us running the conference for 24 hours. Um, and the accent's actually English, a bit of English and a bit of New Zealand and now probably a bit of Aussie in there as well. So. Um, um, yes, yeah, so I've got a bit of a multi, a multi uh, cultural accent there. <laughs> um, oh, look, you're distracting me completely. I should stop looking at the text. It's the trouble with these things, isn't it? And uh, the very first year, and people like Carol will remember, I literally sat up for 24 hours. I was the only one doing this. I sat up for 24 hours, facilitated the whole workshop. For 24 hours, I was totally manic by the end of the, the 24 hours. And I think um, we had, um, you know, we had like three people, maybe six people to a session in our very first conference. And keeping in mind that two of those people would have been the moderator and speaker, um, <laughs> we had a very, very humble beginning. And uh, I think the very first year, Joe, I think we had um, technology issues in the middle of the night and you and your um, dear husband rescued me, if I remember rightly. And um, so it's really quite a spark to be in a big room in my face, remembering these one thing. And it's um, up on the 5th of May, which is the International Day of the Midwife, so that's why we choose the 5th of May. And uh, hopefully you can see here just some stats in terms, and you can see how we've grown. The first line shows how we, um, our average attendance grew from six a session. 220 a session, and then the second line underneath um, in 2011, the average session was 119. Now you'll see in 2012 the, uh, the attendance at the most popular session was 100, and actually that was less than the year before. Now the reason for that was because we moved um, to a different room, and um, in the 2011, I think we had up to 150 seats available, then 2012 we only had 100 seats available. So you can see that there was a full, a full house there 
And in 2013, um, the room was at um, 170 seats. So we've gone from um, the first two or three years we had Illuminate, and that was because of the organization where I was working at provided Illuminate, and then they moved to Adobe Connect, and um, we um, moved to Adobe Connect because of the pragmatics of um, that was what was provided. So in terms of our use of social media, the first few years, I actually we used um, all sorts: YouTube, wikis, Facebook, blogs, you name it. I got an account on it. I did everything, especially in those first couple of years. I say I the first couple of years, it was very much a one-man show, and then then gradually people came on board, and now we're a very organised um, committee. Um, but what I found over the years is that. Um, the amount of time it was we were spending, you know, developing up fancy videos and fancy this and that, it just wasn't worth the time. And the, the bottom line was there was only one or two places where midwives hang out. And um, so we we've gone from using all sorts of tools down to two or three tools that we use because I think it was much better to put our energy into two or three tools. Um, and sites and do that well, rather than spreading ourselves very thin over a whole um, conglomerate of tools and, and not seeing any return investment. So this here you can see some of the tools that we use. Um, our main site is um, a wiki, and um, we've used a wiki space, wiki spaces for that. Um, we have. We use that mostly for all of our, we use it for all our advertising. It's our, our home base. That's where everything goes on. That's where we develop up the program. That's where we have all the information about where the sessions are. Um, right through to that's where we put all our um, committee meeting minutes on there. Anything, everything goes on to that wiki. And the reason why I chose the wiki was because. I wanted it to be collaborative. I wanted it to, for people to be able to see how you could use wikis for collaboration and that people could join in. And so if we were putting up an announcement about a program, people could put in there, oh yeah, I think this is a good idea, or um, here's my EOI. Um, but what we actually found with the wiki is that certainly in the field I work in with the people I work in, midwives, is that they don't understand what a wiki is, they don't understand how it works, they don't understand that they can contribute to it. In fact, actually when you ask them, do you know what a wiki is, they all say no. And then when you say, well, you, you know what Wikipedia is, oh yes, I know what Wikipedia is, but they don't know what a wiki is. So that was, thing, that was quite interesting. Um, but um, I'm glad we did use that wiki because what the joy of it has been over the years is that you can backtrack and see what you've done in the history. And so we reuse a lot of our resources from the year before. Um, that saves us time, but also it's just an amazing record of everything we've done over the years. And Wiki Spaces has some wonderful stats you can check as well. So it really is a living, um, that website really is a living um, artifact. And I'm in, immensely proud of it and all the information and you can track the whole event. Um, over the last six years. We did have it completely open, um, and what I found was it was being spammed, and so I thought you had to lock it down a little bit. So you have to become a member of the wiki before you can comment or con contribute. Um, so that's a bit of a shame that um, they are, that's, that's life. Facebook is our other big um, place where we hang out. Midwives don't do social media very much. Um, they're not very good at it. Um, well, not that they're not very good at it. They, they have concerns and issues with it, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, but having said that, um, the one place midwives really hang out and really like is Facebook. So they're not big on Twitter. They're not big on um, um, Pinterest or any of the other places. But Facebook is the place where they go. And, and so, as much as I have my concerns about Facebook and Going back to the title of my talk, is, is this a, a social media a whole load of frivolous things, or is, can you use it 
seriously. Um, I was never that keen on Facebook because I was well, my brother's very frivolous place, but actually that's where midwives hang out, so that's where we had to go. We do, you, we do have a Twitter account, but um, we don't find that midwives use it very much. Um, but um, but I, every year we see it used a little bit more. We, um, over the years I've used my own personal blog, which I've tied into the weekly in Facebook, and used my blog a lot for collaborative getting people's sense of what they would like and to get advice and to run things past people. But um, I don't blog much these days. In fact, I don't think I've hardly blogged for the last year. So it's interesting that our use of social media has changed over the last few years. Has someone pinged? I think they must have put their hand up. Yes, that was me, Sarah. That was me, Sarah. We've got a, a question there. Shambles wants to know: Do most midwives have smartphones and use smartphones? That's a very good question. Um, they are moving more into um, mobile devices, yes. And it's certainly one of the things that's very much on my mind that we need to capture. We need to move this event more into a mobile environment. Um, especially midwives in developing countries, under-resourced countries, they may not have access to fancy computers, but they all have smartphones. And last year, I got sent a um, wonderful photo of a um, midwife in Africa. Um, in South Africa, he was actually joined our event on his mobile phone, which was um, fabulous. So uh, um, it's certainly something. Good question, and it's an area that we need to be. Um, moving into. And I see that Peggy is saying that um, in teaching and education, teachers are a lot more comfortable with email than social media. And that's certainly been my experience with health professionals. Um, but at the same time, um, when you look at my evaluation, which I'll come to in a couple of slides time, you'll see that actually people find out about this virtual day more through Facebook than they did through email, despite the fact that we use email quite considerably. We blast all our email, you know, all our all our big international email discussion groups. And yet it's Facebook they were hearing about it from. So there's um, there's some pictures last year. Because the beauty of, of Facebook is that it's so easy to share things. And last year we asked people to to take pictures of themselves to send us some selfies. And um, we have some wonderful pictures of people there. Um, there's a midwife that you can see from Indonesia. The one up in the top left-hand corner, she was um, from one of the South Africa, uh, South American um, um, countries, and um, and that and that sharing of images during the day itself just helped to build on that sense of community. So, just talking a little bit more about Facebook and the wiki. In Facebook here, you'll see some stats that um, I've got here. I was able to look back around about the time of our event around on 5th of May um, and look at some stats over the last four years. The trouble with the stats for Facebook is that they change the way they collect stats and they change the stats they actually collect. So sometimes it can be quite difficult to be consistent all the time. But what you will see there is um, a growth in the likes of the page, the reach, in other words, how far the, our, our posts go, and the virality, how many people, friends of friends of friends, actually come in contact with us. Um, if you look at likes, uh, it seems to have gone down for some reason in 2011, and the reason for that was because we um, changed to a different page. That's what we lost a few likes there, and then they grew again. Um, likes actually aren't important in some respects. It's that how far your reach goes, um, and you can see a, a consistent growth there. Um, I talked about the wiki um, and how wonderful that's been as a source of um, um, history. And as I move, as I'm moving away from 
being a one man band, to having a wonderful, wonderful collaborative committee behind me, I am now moving out completely. And so another reason why the wiki has been so good is that it supports sustainability. I've been able to back off, I'm going to be handing over um, control, not control, oh dear, that was a slip of the tongue, wasn't it? Um, handing over facilitation to others and I'm moving away completely and I'm going to go off and do some other stuff soon. But because all the history and everything we've done over the last six years is embedded in that wiki, people can look back. So that makes um, that whole um, sustainability and um, handing over to people so much easier to do. And yes, Joe, you're right. That was a, a, I'm finding it very hard because I've been so embedded in this event for so long. It's very hard to hand it over, as you can imagine. But what has been particularly interesting in these stats, I don't know if you'd be able to see there, you'll see that um, there's been an amazing growth in visitors and amazing growth in total views. Um, but what you'll notice when you look at total views, if you look in 2012 and then look at 2013, there's a drop off. And um, what we've found looking at the, the stats is that um, whilst our visitors are growing, and for example, and the number of views of the certificate of attendance page is growing, and you would, ex and that when you look at the numbers there, the certificate of attendance is around 900 people, and we know that about 900 people came to the event last year. So that that collates because of, um, you know if you go to the event, you then go to the web, the wiki page where you download your certificate of attendance. That um, too late. But what was interesting is that um, we're getting visitors this visit the wiki, but actually they're not looking around and they're not clicking on all the pages. And actually, what we found is um, the number of views on all the different pages. Say, for example, the technology page, which has all the information about how to work with technology, the speakers page, the facilitators page. The, looking, the number of views have dropped off last year compared to the year before. And I'm just wondering, I've got no idea why this is, but I'm hypothesizing that um, people are becoming more um, digitally literate, they're getting more used to the technology. We know that we're getting the same people coming year after year after year. We also are seeing more of this sort of webinar um, event going on, and I'm just wondering why that. I'm just wondering if they're not spending as much time on the wiki because they, they know the information already. But um, that's just a we thought. Uh, the other thing that really fascinated me when I looked at the stats is the recording. I've always been passionate about recording the events and then putting them up on the wiki. And I know that people have used the recordings in their teaching. So, um, and they've used the um, educators have gone on to use the recordings and shared with their literacy students. And so I've always thought it's really important that we continue on with the recording. But when you look at the stats there, the total views of the recordings from June to December, so in the last two years after the event, you'll see that this very small number of views of the recording, 132 in 2012, and only 49 in 2013. So I'm wondering if um, the recordings aren't so important as we think they are, or maybe it's just that we're not getting out the word about the recording enough. I don't know, um, some thoughts that I'm having to think about there. And finally, as I said to you before, the reason why I use the wiki is because I wanted people to comment and contribute. And you'll see there's no stats there at all. And that's because no one is commenting or and the only people who are contributing to the wiki are the um, committee, organising committee. So people just haven't got the hang of what the wiki is about at all. Uh, I'm really running out of time. Um, I'll just flick over really quickly. The event itself, the feedback has always been we run a evaluation every year, as I'm sure you guys are too. Um, they, they love the opportunity to meet in a very flexible way and what they like is being able to, um, ordinary midwives like to be able to talk to um, the speakers who are um, seem to be eminent. And um, in terms of the feedback around the social media, um, they want improved news. They want um, 
they, they want more information. But the trouble is, of course, with using social media, um, using Facebook, it's very serendipitous, isn't it? Uh, you might capture, you might see um, a message about face, uh, the, the day um, when it's posted, and then you might not see it at all. So it's very serendipitous, and how you manage that is a challenge. Very quickly, what we're seeing, and some of the recommendations I would pass on to you if you were thinking about carrying up this sort of event and using social media um, to support any professional development, is that in um, midwifery, and I suspect education is that, or I know education is similar, is that um, some people get it and a lot of people don't. And we've found that our academic midwives don't get it, they don't understand it, they look at social media and anything, there's anything to do with social media with a lot of um, distress, but what the midwives on the ground and particularly um, consumer activists who use social media in other ways, and here you'll see a picture of some people, um, uh, try, um, that consumers are, are always using social media um, to stop the closing down of local birth units, for example. The consumers understand social media, and um, that's, that's what we found. There's the academics up there and the ivory towers that understand it. And in fact, actually, there's a lot of, continues to be a lot of concern about the professional use of social media, which is, which is a problem. And that's one of the reasons why I've been so passionate about using social media, is to show that you can actually use it professionally. We have found that our that there's a network of practice. I call it a network of practice. I'm not quite sure if we're a network or community, to be honest. But what we're finding as the years go by that we're getting to know each other. This, these are some pictures here of us in the organising committee. We, committee. We are based all over the world, and we're actually getting to meet up face to face now. But also, there's a wider network that has become like a network of practice. Um, and what we're finding, and this is an in-joke here, I haven't got time to explain it to you, but what we're finding is the midwives who are joining the event and seeing how things are done are then taking their, that learning into their own practice. And Gloria LeMay here is uh, one of the midwives who's taken the ideas she's learned from our virtual day and running her own um, online education course. So where do we go from here? I think we've got a number of challenges around connecting with midwives in under-resourced countries and those who the English isn't a, their first language. Um, I, I'm very keen to look into uh, does this actually have any impact on learning and particularly then does it impact on clinical outcomes? So for you as teachers attending this event, what are you learning from it and how are you putting it into practice? And is it having any impact on your students? Um, or how do we become more interactive beyond the fifth of May? And I've got a question mark there because actually what I think is that people, they, they are very interactive for that 24 hours and actually afterwards they don't want to be interactive with us anymore. So, you know, we keep going on, but how do we keep this going? But actually the question is, does it need to be kept going? Is it just a one-off thing and everybody really enjoys it in that 24 hours? Learning speak. And then that's it, they go off and do something else for the rest of the year. We talked about the whole um, mobile thing. And I'm looking at my timer, and I've just got a couple more minutes to just pass on some very quick recommendations. And it's going to have to be kids. Keep it simple, stupid. Don't be seduced into using lots of different tools, because you've got to remember the more complicated you get, the more likely you are to lose your audience. And you've got to know who your audience are. We focus very much on using Facebook and Twitter because we know our midwives don't do anything beyond that. If I sent my midwife to this wonderful, you've got a beautiful setup here and, and, and I'm well impressed with it, but if you sent our midwives to your setup here, they, it would blow them away. They wouldn't know where they were, what they were doing. They wouldn't understand what hashtags were and they wouldn't understand what this was or that was. Or, so we keep it very simple, designed for our audience. Be strategic if you're using social media, and, this, um, and by that, um, look at all your stats, look, look at what's capturing uh, people's interests, look what's, um, what isn't, and make
make sure you follow all those rules and guidelines around social media and you know, when you send out posts, what to send out and plan what you're going to do. And I guess one of the other things is, is to remember that social media is about connections and interacting. It's, it's all well and good having Facebook pages um, and Twitter accounts and hashtags. If you're just pushing out information and you don't make it into a two-way conversation, then people aren't going to engage. Um, and then, then finally, keep up to date with changes in social media and the methodologies and how um, these methodologies impact on practice. And I mentioned earlier that um, I had blogged a lot and used my blog a lot, not just to push out information, but to engage with people and get advice and develop a program. We get people to, at the logo, for example, that was developed by someone who had read my blog post about how where well, I was saying, well, I don't know how to make a logo. But I don't blog anymore, and, and it's really interesting to see that people aren't blogging anymore. So people have moved over to Facebook. So if people are moving to Facebook from, their, from blogs, then you've got to follow that and, and use technologies and methodologies that are current. Um, but that's it for me. Oh, how about that? An hour, a minute and a half. No time for any conversation or questions at all. I think I've got about... Just over a minute, if anyone wants to make a very quick comment or question at all. Uh, I'm sure we could go a few minutes, if you like, uh, Sarah, for some talk. Would people like to come to the microphone, please? Please put your hand up and ask Sarah some questions. Um, maybe I see you've asked a question. Have you tried an unconference model? Um, look, it's a, it's, like, say mine, the, the model we use is a bit of, of a mix of, really. We don't, um, we don't have a theme per se. We, um, we do then sort of ask, um, um, calling for EOIs and people present basically whatever they want to. Um, we do, we, up until say, the last two years, we've had to, um, shoulder tap because we've been building. We've had to um, shoulder tap, and um, we've just been grateful to get 24 speakers. Um, the last couple of years, we've had more than 24 EOIs, so we've been able to be a little bit more. Um, you know, we've had more choice. So what worries me a little bit about the unconference model is because we have to do so much work with supporting our speakers to get them to a level where they can do this presentation, these presentations. I don't think our community is at the level where they're skilled enough to be able to take an unconference approach. They have enough trouble with the traditional approach, let alone an unconference approach. That isn't to say that I'm not open to that model or way of thinking. Sarah, can I just ask a question? Do you have specific classes that help the, um, uh, everyone learn the technology first? So do you run sessions just teaching them how to use the technology to get them ready? Yes, we do. We, um, so we, I mean, we see the same as you've done. We, we have all our information on the page and videos and things. Um, all the speakers have facilitators. Um, that work with them, um, and you know, in the two or three weeks in the run up to the conference, and we have practice sessions as well. Thank you. Uh, I think that if we haven't got any more questions for Sarah, um, we'll say uh, thank you very much, Sarah. That was absolutely fantastic. Really pleased you came along, and I've learnt a lot myself, and I'm sure everyone in this room has picked up some really good tips and pointers. And good luck with the next conference. It'll be good to see the uh, statistics in another two years and just see how even further it grows for you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Well, it was fantastic. Well done. Thank you very much, everybody. Cheers.